I was six months old when the war broke out and, when, and the Germans marched into Krakow on September 1st. Uh, so I was only six months old. So we went into the ghetto. I was already, I was a toddler in a, in a baby carriage with my stuff my, and, you know, went into the ghetto. And from the ghetto it became the Krakow Pashov concentration camp, which you see in Schindler's List. My mother was on Schindler's List. She worked for him. And my father worked for Amon Get. He was the commandant of the concentration camp. My father was uh, perfect in German, and he never even made a spelling mistake. So he was a private secretary to uh, Amon Get, who was a psychopath. He enjoyed killing people. Um, I was, you know, I, raised in that, and um, the earliest uh, recollection I had, we, they, they caught my father and we went into the ghetto and we were in a maximum security cell inside the camp, in the ghetto. I keep saying ghetto because the, the ghetto turned into a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, they had us in a little room like 10 by 10, and there must have been 100 people in there and everybody standing up, men, women, and me. And uh, there was a shank, which in Europe, they, you don't have built-in closets. You have closets that, that are stand standalone closet. So my father took me and put me on top of the closet so I wouldn't be crushed by the people. And uh, when we got out of this uh, cell is because they had brought in a uh, prisoner that they had beaten and they put handcuffs on him they were so tight that his hands were blue so my father asked if any woman had a bobby pin with the bobby pin he opened the handcuffs so when the Germans found out he could do that they made him redesign the, the handcuffs for the military but he anything electrical or mechanical he could see it in his mind how it has to work inside he was just intuitive about it he was, a, he was an electrical contractor. He, was a, he was, um, had a master's electrician license, the youngest person in the history of Poland. At the age of 21, he had a master's license. He was very good. So he became the secretary to the Amon Get, to the commandant. My mother worked for Oskar Schindler. And then, uh, you know, that's how it went. But when you say the earliest, is I remember when they had appell. Appell was the in the morning they would have you come out of the barracks and stand at attention. They had a nose count, and if they miscounted, you would stand there till nighttime until they got it right. And if there was any bodies, they would if anybody died, they you know bring them out and they count them so they can have the correct count. Um, it was. Um, <coughs> because my father was perfect in German, and Polish, of course, and um, he had many chances that he could have escaped, and I was a redhead. Uh, my father looked Italian, uh, but, uh, and he could have escaped successfully and taken me with him, but my, he said my mother looked too Jewish, and he would not leave without her. So he was... Um, we, um, we stayed in that, uh, the Plashov ghetto became the concentration camp, and then the concentration camp, they would have Vyshetlenia, which is the, would, they would have rounding up the people and send them to Auschwitz. Auschwitz is only 55 minutes by car uh, from Krakow. And, um, and, you know, when you got there, you got gassed and they got burned. So with, um, uh, Auschwitz and Birkenau were considered Vernichtungslager, means extermination camp. They weren't there to, you know, you just came in in the morning and were dead in the, by the afternoon. So um, when, they, f when they finally, when they um, closed, uh, closing the lager because the Russians were coming, um, they were sending more and more people to Auschwitz to be gassed. And finally my father couldn't hide me anymore. 
so they um, they had me and a number of other kids that they were going to send us to Auschwitz on the next train. And so my father was standing in line, and my, he, he st stood out, came out of line, stepped forward like a soldier, and um, he asked for permission to die with my son, to the commandant, because the Germans, they like theater. So he says, permission granted. So my father went with me to be gassed. So other fathers stepped forward also to go with their sons, and we went off. It took that 55-minute drive by car, took two weeks, because the bombings, the war, it was, it was 44, in 1944 already. So it took two weeks to get there. Uh, in the meantime, we wound up in Brinica. Brinica it was in Czechoslovakia, uh, which is Oskar Schindler's camp. But he was out on business, so my father couldn't talk to him. So they took us then out of Brinica and they sent us to Gro Grossrosen. Grossrosen was hell. Uh, that was the worst. That um, Grossrosen, they, um, first thing they did is they took our clothes, stripped us naked, gave us a hot shower, and then they ran us naked in the snow. And then when we came back from that, they sent us into a barracks, old men and children, <coughs> and they made you sit down on the floor with your legs spread apart like this, and the next person was in your groin. So that's how we, it was wall-to-wall -wall people like that, just the whole floor, naked, like that. <laughs> and I remember being only five years old, I said, I need to make a wee-wee. So my father picked me up, and on the fingers of the prisoners, they carried me to the door. And then when I went outside and I did my business, and they came back on my fingers, they brought me back and to the same spot. I was in my father's groin. Uh, the prisoners themselves at Grossroes and said, is there anything we can do for you? We've been here for two years and we haven't seen a child. Can we do something for you? So they can get us our own clothes back, because they had given us the clothes of, of, of the dead people. And uh, so we got our clothes back, and then they shipped us back out of Grossroes, and they shipped us to Birkenau. Birkenau is next to Auschwitz, but much, much larger. And um, it was when we got to, to Birkenau, by the time we got there, it was, it was two weeks. Um, they sent us in front of um, Dr. Mengele, and he said, Weg mit den Haufen, which means take that pile of manure away. And so they just marched us off to the gas chamber. And we were halfway to the gas chamber, and, um, and this, this place it took place in the Zauna, which was, uh, had tile floors for obvious reasons, because they could hose them down, because people would, from fright would have accidents. Um, I, heard, I, I was a busybody, because I was, I was a redhead. I kept turning around, seeing what was going on. Um, I noticed that there was an officer that handed Mengele a letter, because I could hear him walking, because the Germans had hobnails on their boots, so that you could hear him click, 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 click. And they had a horseshoe on the heel of their shoe, on their boot. Um, <coughs> what, what I do remember was that my, as we were walking, my father started to cry. So I, I told him, because he was always open with me, always told me the truth. And I said, don't be sad, Daddy. At least we're going to die together. And we just, and Mengele opened that letter, read it, and uh, said, Halt, about face, and they marched us back out. Um, and then they gave, they tattooed us, so I have a tattoo, and um, 
they put us into the body of the camp, into the, among, I went to the Kindelaga and my father said he was an electrician, so they had him working on the wire. Uh, <coughs> turns out that the letter that Mengele read, he found out later, was a letter that he got from Berlin, that the, if the Russians were close, or the Russians, they knew the Russians were close, only to, to gas, and not to gas any more people, but just to burn the cadavers. So that's how we were, I was saved, because the letter came just in time. Um, finally, when they closed, were closing Birkenau, they, um, they rounded up my father. He had given me orders, explained to me what to do. I never fall, fall to the back of the line. Always stay to the front. So I, I didn't know why, but you know, that's the, the instructions. <coughs> and he, he, they had him on a, uh, want to put him on a train, and they were sending him to Mauthausen. Mauthausen is, in, uh, is outside of uh, Linz, Austria. Um, so he ran to me, and he gave me last-minute instructions of what to do. And I remember he talked in a very s slow and methodical way, not to get me excited. And the guards were beating him with truncheons. And I saw the welts on his forehead and on his scalp bulging out as they were hitting him on the head. And then they dragged him away. And um, he had filled my uh, pockets with sugar cubes, which he had stolen from the SS uh, lager, um, their um, warehouse, because uh, the Germans were de deathly afraid of electricity, they're being electrocuted. So they gave him a voltmeter. So he took the voltmeter, opened up the back, ripped out the guts and threw them away. <laughs> and when he went into their magazines, in the magazine in the warehouse, he put stuff in it. And that's how he smuggled stuff out. Uh, so. Um, I, we went and we hid in the Krankenlager where the, the sick people were. And the Germans, because we know the Germans were afraid to go into the building because there were people with tuberculosis and typhus and so whatever. So they were afraid of catching something. So they would never go in there. So um, myself, my friend, and a couple of older boys who were 10, 11 years old, we went into the Krankenlager and we hid behind the stove because the stoves ran the length of the barracks. And there was a chimney, so behind the chimney we had a place to hide. And it was my turn to stand guard duty that night. So they had me on guard duty. And I hear, imagine I'm five years old and standing guard duty. And I'd been up all day and I, I fell asleep. I fell asleep <laughs> while I was on guard duty. And um, so I had fallen asleep, and the older boy woke me up because the Germans had f set fire to the barracks because they weren't going in there. So they set fire. So all the people who were in the, in the beds, on the, you know, they were all burnt to death. And we ran outside, and that's when the Germans caught us. And from, from Birkenau, they rounded up any, any stragglers that they could find, and they marched us on a death march to Auschwitz which is uh, just a short distance away. It's and um, as they were marching us, I heard shooting at the back of the line. So <coughs> I, I, being a busybody, I had to go back to take a look. And everybody at the end of the line was being shot. So the whole road was just covered with bodies. And so I ran back to the front. And um, when we got to Auschwitz, the Germans put us there and they ran away because the Russians were so close. They were deathly afraid of the Russians. So um, I, I wound up being, uh, you know, uh, when, the, when the Russians found me the next day, they, um, they thought I had a broken neck. So they sent by ambulance, they sent me to a hospital in Krakow. But I didn't have a broken neck. Um, and from there I wound up in the Jewish orphanage 
in uh, in Krakow, um, and that was in January because January 27th is when uh, Auschwitz was liberated. That's why the International Holocaust Remembrance Day is on that date. Um, so the war wasn't over yet. The war doesn't end until May 8. So you know they, they were marching toward towards Berlin, the Russians, and. Um, so I was in the, in the orphanage there, and uh, <coughs> my mother was liberated uh, at the end of the war by the Russians. My father was in Linz, Austria, in Mauthausen. He was liberated by the Americans, George Patton, the Third Army. And I was liberated by the first Ukrainian division of the Soviet Union and Krakow in, in, in Auschwitz itself. I had actually met one of the soldiers in Washington, D.C. on the memorial, um, barrel-chested fellow, you know, a, a real. Um, so uh, I wound up in the orphanage, and the orphanage was barely enough food, you know, and uh, I could figure things out. I didn't know how to read. I didn't know dates. I didn't know months of the year. You know, there was no point in teaching me anything because I was going to be alive long enough to, uh, you know, take advantage of the education. So, um, but I, I was in a, in a gang in the, in the orphanage, but we weren't the kind of gang. We we robbed people, we broke into cellars and we stole food. You know, that was, um, and they I, I, they could always lift me up. And I could find a way into any, any, through anything. I could just figure it out. Mm -hmm. Just intuitive. So, and um, I was uh, in, in the, on the top floor in the orphanage, and with my feet hanging out of the window, when my mother came. My, when my mother had been in Czechoslovakia. And uh, what happened was, uh, she was suffering from melancholia because she had no husband, no, no brothers or sisters, her family, everybody, and her child, every, everything was gone. And then a woman came and said to her, listen, I was in Krakow, I saw your son. She says, sure you did, you know. She says, what, I wouldn't recognize your little redhead? When she heard redhead, she said, she took off like a, a rocket. She hitchhiked and she found a train and she got to Krakow and to the orphanage. And um, it was funny because they sent a boy up to get me, that my mother was, was there. And um, I, I told the guy to get lost. So they sent another boy. And I, so finally, I, I came came down, this, and my mother said, why didn't you come down first? I said, because a lot of times people came, they said, your, your mother is here. And I would run down, and they, that's not him. And I'd be so disappointed, I didn't want to be disappointed again. So, and then I, f I found her. And, and your dad, how did you reunite with him? Well, we used to listen to broadcasts on the radio, and um, they were, the broadcast would be lists of people who had survived and where they were. So they, there was the, about Linz, Austria, and they were, and you, and you, it's, it's tough to listen to a broadcast where they're reading off name after name, not in alphabetical order, and you're just l listening for a name that's going to catch you. And we found that uh, they, uh, in Linz, Austria, they, uh, on, the, on the list, was my father. So we needed to get to Czechoslovakia, and from Czechoslovakia getting into Austria. Um, we got a, they were found a train, but you couldn't get onto the train because going into the doors, there was people hanging out of the doors. Between the cars, it was filled with people. On top of the train, there were people there was no way that my mother and I were going to get onto this train, except on one of the car, one of the 
cabins or the car on the train, or guys that come over here. And he lifted us out through a window onto the train into one of the cabins. That's how we got in. They lifted me and my mother. Uh, and we got to Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia, we found a guide who guided us at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and he was very specific. He said, you put your foot where I put my foot because this is a minefield. And if you don't, you know. So just follow him through the minefield. We got to the other end. We saw American soldiers. And we were in American-occupied Austria at the time. We went to Linz. From Linz, uh, we found my father. And then from there, we went to Regensburg. And then Schweinfurt am Main. And from Schweinfurt, we came to, uh, well, there was a little, sh a little, lived in a little town called Schonungen. Uh, and then we uh, came to America in 1950. Did you have siblings? I had an older brother, but he died of natural causes before the war. Before the war, okay. And my mother, and during the war, my mother had to have abortions, because mm. she, she only had sons. Right. And uh, had the Germans found that she was pregnant, they would have killed her. Right. Uh, being that you have been in the Bronx now so many years, and you see the rise, recent rise in anti-Semitism, how does that make you feel? They're kind of disappointed because um, when I went to college, upstate New York, I, I said to myself, because they, they talked about the, the, when the guys were talking about different people, uh, the upstaters, they used the term for Italians, which I wouldn't want to use, and for the Irish, and for the Jews when they talked about these expletives. And I said, you know, I live in a wonderful place in the Bronx. Because I had asked them, what, did, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? They explained it to me. And I said, I live in a wonderful place in the Bronx, which was Italian, Irish, uh, Jewish neighborhood off the Grand Concourse. Because I had never heard those terms. Because it was... If you were a jerk, you were a jerk because you were a jerk, not because you were whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's kind of disappointing that uh, it, things have degenerated to that point. Mm -hmm. it, it, I thought it was uh, w just a wonderful place to, to grow up. It was a special place. Mm -hmm. What neighborhood was this that you grew up in? Excuse me? You grew up in Riverdale or a different neighborhood? No, I, I, in, in the Bronx. In Grand Concourse? And, uh, right off the Grand, on Valentine Avenue, 183rd Street. Okay, got it. And then to 182nd, 181st Street, also Valentine Avenue. Um, and, uh, you know, good memories of the Lois Paradise and the RKO and Crumbs. Uh, and you could walk in the middle of the night. It was light and it was just a wonderful place to grow up. Do you believe that telling your story is important? Well, I hope so. Um, I wouldn't do it otherwise. Um, I didn't really talk about the war until I was in my later 40s with anybody who wasn't a, a fellow prisoner. We didn't discuss it. And that's because my daughter had gone to Solomon Schachter uh, uh, great school, mm -hmm. and they had talked about the Holocaust, and she said, "My daddy was in the Holocaust." You know, so they asked, uh, "Would your daddy come and talk to us?" And that's the first time I ever talked about the Holocaust to uh, to anybody that wasn't part of our. Um, so it it it's it's not easy. Because um, what happens is, after I speak with you, I'm going to have a difficult time going to sleep tonight. Because it regurgitates a lot of different uh, thoughts. You know, people would say, how was it? You know, you, it's very hard to explain how you can be 24, hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, live in total terror. 
not fright, but terror that you know that any moment you could be you could be killed at any moment for any reason so it you know it, it it psychologically it just eats at you <laughs>